Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Kane Vineyard and Winery, a Napa Valley winery committed to respecting the soil and dedicated to the creation of three Cabernet blends. For more information, visit Kane5.com. I'm Brianna Kurtz, host of Eat Your Words. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And today you have tuned in to the Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. And before we start the show, uh, I want to give just a quick reminder. We are in the middle of our summer uh, fun drive. We do hope that those of you out there listening, if you believe in the Farm Report and the work that we're doing here at Heritage, that you will consider taking a moment to visit our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org, and to click that Donate tab and become a member today. Thanks so much for uh, continuing your support. So um, we are going to be jumping into uh, what I hope will be quite a lively discussion. We are on the line with Doug Fine to talk a little bit about his new book, Hemp Bound, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Next Agricultural Revolution. Doug, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I feel like I need to start with kind of the, the basics here and, and ask you, um, what, what is hemp? When we're talking about hemp, what are we talking about? What are we not talking about? That is a good place to start. I sometimes start like four steps in like how hemp is going to save humanity in the next 20 years. And it's like, okay, let's define the plant. Um, it is any variety. This is how it's characterized the world over in the worldwide hemp industry. It is any variety of the cannabis plant with 0.3% THC or less. That's the psychoactive component in cannabis. So it is as inert as any other farm product like, you know, Corn, wheat, soy, broccoli, fruit. Got it. So, so I can't get stone smoking any version of hemp. Um, unless you get high smoking broccoli or corn, no, you can't. You can't feel psychoactive effect from hemp. It's a totally different um, variety. You know, in so many plants, um, they're connected. That have very, very seemingly different plants that have different uses for humans, are all from the mint family, are all from the maple tree family, whatever it is. And um, if that's how it is with, with hemp. It's not uh, in any way related to, to psychoactive cannabis except for the fact that the leaves look similar, but they can never be confused um, because they're grown so differently. Hemp is famous for its biomass production per acre, and that's one of the things that is going to help with safety math. It's energy production, potential. Um, but Psychoactive cannabis plants are every plant is accounted for. It's their manicured plants that are harvested from the female flower, which is the market hemp you're growing for the seed oil and the fiber, and it's dense, dense field. There's been zero cases of confusion, Aaron, um, between psychoactive and hemp in Canada's 15-year-long modern industry, which, by the way, this year is going to be worth a billion dollars to Canadian farmers. So why, you know, hemp has been, like the hemp production in the U.S. has been outlawed for a long time. Where did that come from? Why did that happen? Well, as a full-time drug policy researcher for the last five or so years, because my book before hemp was called Too High to Fail, 
And pr- prior to that, the book was called Farewell My Subaru. That was about getting off of fossil fuel, still drive on vegetable oil, live on a solar powered go ranch in southern New Mexico. So um, I mention this because where I'm coming into hemp found is as somebody that is living with very little petroleum and a serious sustainability journalist and who has researched the sustainable psychoactive cannabis industry. Um, you know, I can tell you that looking for logic and reason in U.S. drug policy is um, its not an exercise of madness. It's endless opportunities for graduate students doing psychology paper, anthropology paper, sociology papers. Like, how on earth could a plant this useful and this desirable have been banned for 77 years? So in that amount of time I, that I just spent expressing astonishment, I guess I could have given you some answers about what was happening around 1937, but the truth is, is it was, didn't make sense then, and it doesn't make sense now, and it's an, it's an amazing, it's a, a, in, in Hempbound, I call it an astonishing no-brainer, like the U.S. Congress has agreed. It's like, I'm, I'm this engaged patriotic voter who never sees anything I want happen on the federal level, then boom, here it is. Go for it. Hemp's back. Now, granted, what the Farm Bill did this past February was only allow hemp cultivation for research purposes in states that have their own hemp legislation. But the Berlin Wall is down, the DEA opposed it, and they lost on common sense ground. And the profits that Canadian farmers are making are such that um, we're going to see it as a major industry uh, in the U.S. and very, very soon, without a doubt. So there are, you know, it is like limited states that, you know, we're looking at Nebraska, Indiana, South Carolina, and I think Tennessee. Um, Is there anything like that you, is there any reason like why those states? Is there uh, an agriculture history there? Is there a a kind of climate or geographic um, distinction that makes them particularly suited to hemp? Is there just, you know, a legislator who was like, yeah, I'm going to get on board with this. Why? Why is that kind of the the trickle that is you know potentially opening this uh, flood of hemp production? Interestingly, in the 15 states and gr- counting um, that now allow cultivation at least at the level that federal law allows, uh, the reasons really vary. What in the deep south? The reason why you're seeing Kentucky, Tennessee, and South Carolina is yeah, there's a traditional hemp industry that's been a, a a catalyst that has helped uh, leap any kind of political or, or culture war barriers. Um, Thomas Jefferson cultivated hemp. The Declaration of Independence was crafted on hemp campus on the covered wagon. And the root of the word cannabis uh, was, you know, that settled the West. So you're seeing that there. Um, Hawaii was one of the 15 states, and it is purely about self-sufficiency and independence. They pay so much for animal feed, and they have soil problems from uh cattle grazing and uh, sugar cane and other fruit monocultures. They need the soil remediation qualities of hemp. Um, and then Colorado, which is the head of federal law, it's state agriculture department. I was there on the day they started accepting applications. Um, they are accepting unlimited commercial cultivation permits for hemp, the head of federal law. Um, and the reason for that, and really the bottom line reason for the hemp, the hemp law on the federal level in all the states, is bottom line. Today, Canadian farmers, for the seed oil, it's an omega balanced superfood. This is what them, that's all the Canadians grow for. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things that I like to think of found is that I went the world over and examined what the hemp industry is like in some places. And very segmented. And Canada, Canada does almost only seed oil. And Canadian farmers last year profited, profit $250 per acre. Um, and so, just to, by comparison, South Dakota predicts $71 per acre profits. So look a little bit north, and you're making triple the money on a crop that takes half the water, uh, requires no pesticides. Um, it, it's dry land croppable in places that are seeing climbing uh, aquifers. So it, it's a real um, win-win for farmers from a bottom line standpoint. All the things that we can talk about for the rest of the segment about saving the planet come from the fact that Farmers who are business people like everyone else make money from it, and they realize that South Carolina to Hawaii. That makes a lot of sense. Well, before we kind of get into to some of the you know the, the uses of hemp and some of the economics and some of the you know climate benefits that you talk about in your book, I'm wondering if you can kind of take us through the the, the structure and the life cycle of the plant. Um, you know, is hemp is something that you 
kind of grow from seed? Um, is there like a, a cyclical element to it? Can you just kind of talk us through, you know, what it looks like, how long it takes to grow, what the what the general like life of a of a hemp plant contains? Mm-hmm. So it's a dioecious annual. Um, so there's male and female plants, and you plant it every year from seed. Um, and a couple of interesting qualities that hemp has. One of the most important qualities that it has in the climate change era, especially in places like uh, the American heartland, which is suffering from drought in sub-Saharan Africa, um, is that for an annual, it has tap roots that grow long and fast. Foot long tap roots that grow very quickly. So um, it traditionally has been used. I've had Nebraska ranchers tell me about their, you know, granddaddies. And the first thing you did as you're getting ready for planting is get the hemp seeds in along the irrigation ditch because if it's a really wet season, the erosion control is going to be so great from those strong foot long tap roots and then it's high protein finish for the cattle in the fall. But your, the main thing is it's preventing flood, flooding of your other crops. The other thing about, so it grows on marginal soil as well, which is why there's a utility run by a hardcore conservative fellow um, buying tobacco and coal damage land pennies on the dollar to plant hemp on um, for use in a utility for in, a, in a anaerobic carbon from the energy production that can help America become energy independent called biomass gasification, which frankly as a father has me um, the most excited. But back to the soil um, remediation qualities of hemp. Um, it's also a bridge crop. So that by which it, I mean it has a short growing season. So um, Farmers can actually grow, let's say, another cereal crop or a nitrogen-fixing crop on the same, and or I should say, depending on the climate, on the same season that they're growing um, hemp uh, harvest. People, Farmers that are devoted to hemp can grow two crops, perhaps one that's more of a seed oil crop and one that's more of a fiber uh, crop. But I, I kind of advocate in hemp bound for growing one harvest that uh, does all three branches of tri-cropping oil, fiber, and energy. Got it. So one of the things that you noted in the book that I thought was interesting is is talking about kind of um, because we haven't been producing hemp in this country for the last, you know, 70 plus years, we have lost kind of seeds that are adapted to kind of regional var- variation. So if, as we're kind of anticipating an increase in production, where is that seed stock coming from, and and how kind of like optimistic or pessimistic are you feeling about the um, kind of rebuilding of that biodiversity with regards to the hemp seed? The genetic story is really it's got an Indiana Jones component to it. It's kind of exciting. So, a researcher named Dave West, um, he used to work for big ag and got uh, disgusted by it. It said it was not agriculture anymore. It's chemical industry. So um, he quit and discovered hemp kind of by accident. He saw a taxpayer-funded raid, raid of a wild hemp field near his farm in Wisconsin. And, you know, this is a trained scientist. He was watching lunacy. He was watching, like, a military invasion of, of, of like, it might as well have been a cornfield. And um, so he started researching what, what's going on with this. I, I think his exact quote to me that's in the book is, what the hell is going on here? And uh, this was back in the 90s, and um, uh, discovered a lot of the uh, qualities of hemp, including the tensile strength that's stronger than steel today. Hemp fibers are in uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, door panels and others, and increasingly biofibers, anything that plastic and, um, and potentially dangerous nanotechnology, nanoparticles can do, hemp can do better and safer. Hemp and other biomaterials, so hemp is really one of the best. Um, plastic, the sealant for plastic, I saw an entire tractor uh, so Dave West started to realize and research all this stuff. This is all knowledge that most of the world still knew and the U.S. had only recently lost. So he said, all right, we need to get this going again. He started by going to the National Seed Repository in Virginia. And this is the Indiana Jones part, you know. He was looking for the official federal supply of a seed that had been, at that point, um, pretty much forgotten for 60-plus years. It wound up being 77 years of prohibition. Uh, February 7th, Obama signed the farm bill. Anyway. So you can imagine the dust uh, being blown off of bio cabinets and crowbars uh, being pry, uh, using to pry off wooden crates in the back of some forgotten warehouse. And what he found was two open bags of long-rotted Kentucky, Kentucky hemp seed stock, which was 
um, the pride of the, the envy of the world. It, it was the result of uh, more than a half century of not only government funding and research. There's a great photo a friend of mine turned up uh, of a USDA researcher uh, doing hemp research, taxpayer-funded hemp research for American farmers uh, on a meadow that today is the Pentagon, uh, but also uh, contest farmers that produce the best quality hemp won some huge prize and huge uh, uh, contracts and stuff as the, uh, what it really was is the military, 40 tons of hemp rope rigging for Navy vessels, um, and, and also the hemp uh, webbing and the fiber that Dave George H.W., which is uh, life parish, uh, back a little bit too. So, um, uh, you know, it works the best. It's the, needed, it's the most needed fiber, as we discovered after the Philippines captured our uh, Foreign sources. After the Japanese captured our, our, our Filipino sources during World War II, so um, the uh, feedstock somehow this genetics has been lost. So what we're doing now is is rebuilding it. And the story I'll tell you the mundane long term. The story that really folks listening today really need to understand is that the uh, cultivars of the varieties are known that are going to win out are specific to each region and to the applications that are needed. And they're probably going to be a blend of importing the two or so dozen, you can go to the Canadian uh, government's website of approved M cultivars, Canada, other countries as well, Britain, Cultivate the Paramount, France, Romania, China, uh, grows the most of textile. Um, and find the cultivars that are available on the world market, and it will probably be, as it was the last time, uh, American Ingenuity um, hybridizing um, you know, local, uh, what I call the Darwin cultivars, the, the hemp seeds that have survived prohibition in ditches combined with established cultivars. Um, and as long as there's a GMO ban on, I'm fine with that. The, Canada has banned genetically modified hemp even since day one in 1998 of their modern industry. And uh, we should, of course, do that, that, do that as well. Um, and then the, the postscript I should mention about that is, although... I have no doubt that the rebuilding will happen and will happen relatively quickly. Um, we shouldn't um, pretend that the, you know it's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, people worldwide dancing around a rainbow. Um, if you want to have a standardized cultivar, there is a process that you have to go through of certification, growing it for a certain number of years. Um, and so it's important that we get this industry going uh, right away because it's going to take some time to rebuild it. Well, on that note, we are going to move to just a, a short break to hear a little bit from our sponsor, Doug. I'm going to have you uh, hang on the line, and we'll be back in just a minute. This is Chris Howell from Cane Vineyard and Winery, calling in from Spring Mountain above the Napa Valley. Thank you for listening to this show. In our industrial world of highly processed food and wine, we support the values of Heritage Radio Network. All of us at Cane encourage you to seek out individuality and beauty in everything you eat and drink. To learn more about us, go to Cane5.com. Hi, I'm Reggie Watts, and you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.org. And we are back. We are on the line with Doug Fine uh, talking about the world of hemp. So in the first half of the show, Doug, you were kind of taking us through a little bit of the history of, uh, or lack of history, I guess, of hemp production here in the U.S. and, and some of the things that we have to look forward to. Now, I, I saw a stat in your book that, what was it, Popular Mechanics, said there's 25,000 different applications for hemp, and obviously we're not going to go through all of those on the show today, but can you maybe break down for us, like, what are the kind of main 
categories of uses, and, and do they come from different parts of the plant? Yes. Um, to, I'll go through the three legs of, them, of the what I call the tri-cropping of hemp in, in hemp bound. The first one, again, we, we touched, touched on a little bit, is hemp seed oil, which is extremely profitable. It's an omega superfood. I put it in my morning shake um, every day. Um, it's um, basically does what flax oil or, or cod liver oil does in terms of high protein, but in some cases better with high, more minerals. Um, plus if, if folks, folks don't, you know, if they're vegetarian. Um, so, um, that's a booming market that's growing 24% a year and bringing Canada a billion dollars and Colorado farmers this year have 600 commercial acres as well. So they're, that, that, that's market number one. The oil, uh, is mostly used for food, but it also can replace Toxic sealant. Um, there's a company called Hemp Shield that does wood uh, covering, um, you know, deck coverings and, and building material coverings, but also for things like uh, I, saw, I mentioned earlier, I saw a hemp fiber tractor, a tractor body made of local hemp fiber that's going to be, it's in trials now, actually harvesting the, the hemp fields. This is in uh, Manitoba, province, Canada. Um, but the fibers have to be sealed, right? So instead of using the you know, volatile compounds or other noxious things, um, the hemp oil has applications uh, there as well. So that's, that's leg number one of tri cropping. Leg number two, and I want to see this in every American facility, ideally benefiting local communities owned by local farming communities or regional counties uh, that are going to receive the third leg, which is energy. So we'll, we'll get onto that. Uh, fiber has a broad range of applications. Um, I often wear hemp clothes. Those are generally made in China. Um, there's, as we discussed, industrial applications already. Um, hemp plastic is uh, huge. Um, and healthy, but the first killer app for fiber that I see in the U.S. is in construction, and it's because it requires less of a learning curve in the post-harvest threading process and the treatment of the fibers that you really have to do if you want those high-end applications. Um, as there's a learning curve and we're, we're growing for the first time in a long time here, frankly, all you have to do to make what's known as hemp creep building material is chop up your herd, the less valuable part of the fiber, and uh, bag it up and get it to the local hardware store. Because uh, builders mix that with lime or another binder, and it creates uh, a building material that can be used for everything from insulation with a higher R value, that's insulation quality, uh, than pink fiber glass, uh, better fill and safer than some of the toxically off gas and imported drywall you've been seeing here in recent years. And then it can be used for even load bearing and soundproof, which works uh, very well for it. One facility I went uh, researched hemp building fiber work, it was, I was astounded uh, that, the, that the researchers built their own block of hempcrete um, out of a special mixture for soundproofing because it kept their own air compressors and such quieter than any other building materials they could use. I mean, that was a big selling point that, 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 that the folks are choosing to use it <laughs> in their own facility. Um, so hempcrete, I think construction is going to have a really, really big future, especially as people are wanting to live in healthier homes. It, Sequesters carbon from the environment. It's very sturdy, breathable. It's, it's a terrific material, um, and it's, it's already starting from. We're seeing hemp houses from North Dakota to Hawaii to Canada to Africa. So, well, that that was kind of like my next question is obviously as we are increasing the kind of agriculture production, there is the infrastructure to you know, manage those harvests and the different kind of product lines that things go into. So what are you seeing as some of the kind of, you know, barriers as we look to scale up production and, and turn the hemp into kind of end user processes? Is there, is that, is that space looking like it's going to be able to keep up with production? You, you know, what are those kind of infrastructure pieces, those secondary businesses that are going to be responsible for converting the hemp into the, some of the products you've talked about? Before I, I um, pull out my optimistically tinted crystal ball, I um, should answer the, the, the previous question because on the third leg of tri- the tri cropping sort of uh, holes there, the, the foundation. Um, the third thing that I want every facility to have is one of these gasification units, energy production units that's allowing energy to kind of fall over uh, Europe now. Um, farm waste biomass goes into uh, a unit that is extremely high heat and anaerobic and used with the biochar. Uh, it's also usable and it's very carbon friendly. Um, and it's a way for communities to take over their own power supply and also for America to be safer through a decentralized grid of energy that's carbon friendly. 
and win, 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 win. No more farm, no more including coal. Um, and so that can really happen. They're not that big a, the unit. Uh, they, they're scalable. I've seen them up to community size and down to outhouse size, which is what the Army is buying um, because they're finding it's easier to produce energy on site and dangerous when diesel generates uh, long areas and dangerous areas. Um, and I've seen, let's say, a farm in Maine that's totally powered by this farm wind. So those are the three legs. And then into potential barriers. First of all, the fact that hemp prices are so high now and the industry is growing by double digits annually, um, does that mean it's going to be that way forever? It doesn't mean that. I know that we're just scratching the surface and that humans have been using this plant for as long or longer than just about anything else. So I'll just call it a, uh, I'll just call it a uh, camp follow plant. But even before we settled down from nomadic uh, era, we were taking with us because it was that valuable for so many things, clothing and housing and, and medicine, uh, especially food and animal, human and animal. So um, I don't think that it's, uh, a flash in the pan. I think it's going to be something that's established for our food system. And um, so, hurdles. Well, there are plenty. First of all, it, current prices don't mean forever prices. Um, uh, the Chinese, for instance, have a huge lead in textile. So is South Carolina going to immediately open up its closed traditional you know, clothing factories? I, I'd love to see that, um, especially with 21st century values and all that. Um, but bigger picture, and we have a short-term problem of just the last throes of the drug war. Um, in recent weeks, by the changes to federal law, the DEA is kind of, you know, doing what the DEA does, throwing up last roadblocks on technicalities, season seed shipments that should be going to American farmers. China's president goes, visits hemp fields, and demands that Chinese farmers grow more hemp for the good of the country. China's, uh, Canada funds its cultivar research, um, and we have to worry about uh, uh, an outdated agency seizing uh, seeds. And this is an administrative problem. The actual folks that work for our federal agency are all hardworking people that I honor. And, and in fact, I'm talking about a policy change. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of last-minute uh, road blocking, and, and, and for that we require a little bit more a law change to allow full commercial cultivation nationwide without any questions pulling all hemp out of control of back federal drug laws and uh, putting it into the purview of USDA as other farm crops are. And that bill, S-359, is going through Senate right now. Folks should call their senators I support S-359 if they want to see full commercial um, cultivation. But big picture, um, I'm very, very optimistic about it because farmers are savvy people. They are not joking around in terms of the ledgers, you know, they look and they see what it makes sense to grow, and that, that's why we're hearing so much about hemp. It's not not because it's cute or even because it really is going to help the country. It's because individual farmers know that they're going to get a successful harvest on marginal land that's going to pay them more than the GMO cycle. So in conclusion, I want to say that when I hear, when I, one of the most common questions I hear is, well, what about big ag and, 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 uh, monoculture and, and the model that, that we see today, what, where does hemp fit into that and might it might be co opted Well, as long as we in the U.S. implement what Canada has today, one with genetically modified hemp ban, hemp, then because hemp requires so few pesticides and herbicides, it does none needed under, under the uh, official Canadian guidelines for how to, how to cultivate stuff. Because of those realities, I'm fine if we see a replacement for bottom line reasons of amber waves of genetically modified grain, that corn that, that, you know, many people believe, many legitimate studies show, and contributing everything to obesity, diabetes, uh, unhealthy farming conditions, livestock, feed, et cetera, et cetera. If we replace that whole nightmare cycle um, with a bridge crop, waving amber ha ha uh, hands of cannabis to cover a hemp bound looks like, um, that's the message I'm preaching everywhere, that that's going to be good for America. Big farmer, small farmer, uh, we need to get this uh, favorite crop on the back in the ground. Well, Doug, we are out of time. Thank you so much for taking some time out to share some highlights from the book. Thanks for having me. 
So if you're out there, folks, the book again is Hemp Bound, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Next Agriculture Revolution. You can pick it up uh, wherever fine books are sold or visit Doug's uh, website to, to learn more and stay updated as he follows those bills through different parts of the legislature. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of The Farm Report. This, like all 35 of our live weekly shows, is available for free as a download through our website. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher Smart Radio. As I said at the top of the show, we are in the middle of a fun drive. I do hope you'll become a member today. would love to uh, have your support. Thanks so much for listening, and stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archive programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.